greetings to a class of students whom I more than likely will never meet. Strange times. This is the only time this semester when you'll see my face on camera. I'm addressing you this way to start off this series of video lectures because I want to begin the semester by making a point that I think is central to everything I'm going to try to teach you during our time together. You are looking into the face of an African. And if these were normal times and I were standing in front of you in a classroom, I would be looking back into the faces of Africans. Some of you undoubtedly are wondering whether I've lost my mind already this early in the game. The fact is, I wasn't born in Africa, nor have I ever lived there or even been there. But that doesn't change one of the fundamental facts about me and about you, because the fact is, if we trace our ancestry back far enough, we are all Africans. In fact, we're Africans twice over, once because our species evolved there and once because we survived there. If you don't know what I mean by that second claim, I'll explain it near the end of this online semester when we explore some of the music of Sub-Saharan Africa. If you deny my first claim, you have some learning to do. As I said in my syllabus, education begins with unlearning a great deal of what we think we already know. The reason I felt the need to begin this way is that a large segment of the population of the United States seems to have forgotten that basic fact about us, assuming they ever knew it in the first place. We live at a horribly divided time, and those divisions are not limited to this country by any means. All over the world, we see and have seen people oppressing and killing each other, other people whom they imagine to be different from them, lesser than them. I grew up in a hotbed of white supremacy, and I know its ugly face firsthand, and I deplore it. And I think the only way out of the trap that we find ourselves in is in a deep recognition of our commonality. And it seems to me that there is no better justification possible for a course in world music than to try to establish that fact. All humans are musical. They surround themselves with music. They celebrate with music. They dance together with music. They sing together, they share musical experience. That penchant for music making lies very deep within our evolutionary history. In fact, I suspect that music is as old as language and that music and language have a common origin. They grew out of the same deeply human impulse. Consider the fact that of all the great apes, our species alone is musical in any measurable way. Our closest relatives, the chimps and bonobos, have never been observed to sing or dance or drum in any recognizable way. I suspect that's owing to two facts about us that are not true of them. First is the fact that we are the ones with a fully upright posture. We alone among the great apes have not four hands, but two hands and two feet. That's done more for us than made us the champion runners of the animal kingdom. That fact accounts for an experience that we have all the time, but that our nearest relatives, who for all their intelligence are nevertheless knuckle walkers, will never have. That is the mere fact of walking in a steady, rhythmic way, left, right, left, right, left, right. Therein surely lies the foundation of our rhythmic sense. One, two, one, two, one, two. It's an experience that surely provides the foundation for all of our dancing and drumming, an experience that our nearest cousins will never have. The other is our amazing vocal apparatus, which is not shared by our relatives. Partly owing to our dentition pattern, our palates are arched just so, accommodating an enormous range of vocalizations not available to chimps and bonobos whose teeth are arrayed in a more nearly rectangular way with a concomitant flattened palate. They cannot sing, 
neither can they speak. It is not lack of intelligence that holds them back. It is a simple fact of physiology. Our dentition pattern and arched palates are found in fossilized human skulls dating back hundreds of thousands of years at a time when all humans lived in Africa. For those of us who have never personally lived in Africa, it is nevertheless true that no matter how long your ancestors or mine have lived in Europe or Asia or Australia or the Pacific Islands or the American continents or anywhere else, your remotest ancestors were Africans. It is a fact of cladistics that whatever your ancestors were, you still are. And it is certain that as modern humans, that is species Homo sapiens, began migrating out of Africa about a hundred thousand years ago, they took with them language, singing, drumming, and dancing along with other such cultural trappings as tool making technologies. Those things are shared by all of our cultures. Those things are, in all likelihood, as ancient as our species itself. And during these weeks together, we're going to be exploring a little of the modern fruit that that ancient tree of music has borne. We'll be looking at music by Native Americans, by musicians in India, Afghanistan, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Africa. It will be a whirlwind tour, and I'll only have time to scratch the surface at best because I'm going to spend a lot of our time together explaining the mechanics of music and how they apply to the music we hear. My reason for that is quite clear, and I urge you not to lose sight of it if you find yourself overwhelmed by more details than you'd bargain for. One can appreciate fully only what one understands. One can love completely only what one loves coherently. I'm going to try to give you some tools, and if you'll accept my gift, you'll find that those tools will serve you well for the rest of your life as you come in contact with more and more music, and as your tastes in music change with further maturity, just as your taste in food and drink has changed, and your taste in literature. Those things have changed, haven't they? If they haven't, you might want to take a close look at that and take the necessary steps to remedy it, to catch up. As I indicated in my syllabus, which I devoutly hope you've read for understanding, my mind has changed about absolutely everything over the course of my life, and I don't consider myself to have lost anything of value in the process. One more thing, and then I'll proceed with a short lecture on aesthetics and acoustics. I once had a neighbor who, during nice weather, unfurled a big colorful banner on the side of his house. The banner bore this message, God bless this house, this city, this nation. Every time I saw it, I thought, well, that's a sweet sentiment. I really can't quarrel with it. But why stop there? Why not God bless the whole continent, or God bless this hemisphere, or God bless the entire suffering world? Why draw your lines at the national boundary? Isn't it only a small conceptual step from doing that to building a fence along that boundary, or a high wall? I think my neighbor, well-intentioned though he undoubtedly was, was making a mistake. And I think one of the best reasons that any university would offer a course in world music with the expectation that it will fulfill a requirement in a liberal arts core curriculum is to help you avoid the mistake that I think my neighbor was making. I don't for a moment discourage anyone from loving and appreciating their culture. I don't even object to that basic sense that all of us have, but mostly harbor secretly, that our culture is the best imaginable, or at least the best available. Haven't all people thought that, or something like it, throughout history? Do by all means be a champion of your culture, but also do by all means recognize that other people in other cultures feel the same way about theirs, and with perhaps equal justification. In light of this fact, how should we proceed? 
here's a thought. Begin by recognizing the truth of what I just said and commit yourself to broadening your understanding. It's a curious, paradoxical fact that the culture you were born into both made your forging of an identity for yourself possible and locked that identity in a kind of prison. All of us are trapped by our culture to a greater or lesser degree. That fact may finally be insurmountable, but at least we can knock a few bricks out of our constraining walls and sneak a peek at what's out there. You never know where you might discover the value of that. All right, let's think a little about aesthetics. The word's meaning is obvious, and if it hasn't hit you yet, just try constructing its negative. That is, add the prefix an to it. You know what an anesthetic is, right? It's something that numbs you, that takes away your feeling. So aesthetics must have something to do with feeling, mustn't it? Formally speaking, aesthetics is a branch of philosophy that's concerned with why it is that art evokes an emotional response in us. Why do we find some works of art, and this of course includes music, beautiful? and other works repulsive? Isn't that an interesting question? It's a question that aesthetics attempts to answer. And here's a related question. Why is it that music that sends me into transports of ecstasy is a matter of complete indifference to other people? I've noticed the same in other contexts. There are paintings and other art objects that I love so much that I've spent hours in front of them, just drinking in every detail. Some of them are in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, just across the Greenway from the university where I did my doctoral studies. I spent a lot of time there back during the 90s. In particular, there's a painting of an olive orchard made by Vincent van Gogh that's so alive it practically squirms under my gaze, those brush strokes pulling my eyes this way and that, never letting me go. I've stood in front of that painting for so long that on two occasions I had to be run out of the museum by the guards at closing time. In that same museum, there's a huge lily pond painting by Claude Monet that does the same thing to me, and a rice paper screen from 16th century Japan painted with brushed ink and just a few daubs of colored pigment, and an Inuit mask from above the Arctic Circle carved from birch wood and graced with cowrie shell embellishments and what looked to be hairs from the whiskers of seals or walrus and hollow eyes that might be gazing 10,000 years into the past or 10,000 years into the future, but in any event are gazing right through me. I've stood there with Nietzsche's aphorism ringing in my ears. When we stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back into us. And yet, as I've stood enwrapped before those treasures, those expressions of the human spirit, I've been aware of dozens to hundreds of museum visitors stopping for a quick glance and then moving right on to the next thing. What is it, I've wondered, that makes our responses to the same art so different? I'm certainly not more intelligent than they, nor am I less. Intelligence has nothing to do with it. Where could I find an answer to this puzzle? If there is an answer, it too will be found in aesthetics. And although this is not a course in aesthetics, I think we need to begin this way because this course will only be of value to you if you're open to making the effort to understand the music you hear rather than indulge an impulse to dismiss it as ugly and unworthy of your time or, worse yet, remain indifferent to it and treat the course content only as a means to racking up points on quizzes and checking one more aggravating curricular requirement off your list. I'll start with Goethe's three questions. They're actually questions for play analysis, but I believe them to be extensible to art overall. Let me set it up for you. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was born in 1749 
and died in 1832. Over the course of more than eight decades, he saw the world, which meant for him, Europe especially, change in fundamental ways. He himself had a hand in those changes because not only was he a playwright and art critic and poet and musician, he was also a botanist and a statesman. He was a friend of Beethoven. He's widely regarded as the greatest writer of modern German culture. He was what some people in a later century called a Renaissance man, someone who during his lifetime managed to learn almost all there was to learn in the arts and sciences of his day. Of course, since his time, knowledge has exploded in such an exponential fashion that no one can know all there is to know. We have of necessity become narrow specialists. It may be hard even to imagine a mind like Goethe's, as our own century seemingly has no use for such a thing and wouldn't even accommodate it. I would argue that therein lie many of the ills that beset our modern societies. I mentioned that Goethe was both an art critic and a playwright, and it is on account of those things that he formulated his three questions. He was bedeviled by bad arts criticism in the newspapers, which betrayed a complete lack of understanding. So he formulated these three questions for play analysis, hoping to raise the consciousness of those critics. I'd say the results were mixed. As I said, these questions are extensible to all the arts. And since I am, in a sense, challenging you to become music critics during the short time we have together, I think you might find these questions useful. I also think they have the potential to help you avoid some common mistakes. The questions are, what was the artist trying to say? How well did the artist say it? Was it worth saying? Have you ever heard someone say, or heaven forfend, have you ever said something like, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like? I have to admit that I've done just that numerous times, and I've been wrong every single time, because that glib dismissal is an indication that the speaker has given no thought whatsoever to the art they're criticizing, has never bothered with Goethe's three questions. The first question is one of the artist's intentions in making the work, and if you don't understand this about it, you have no hope of an appropriate aesthetic response to that art. In other words, you may have an opinion, but your opinion is worth precisely squat. From what I've said, I think you can understand that whenever I play a really unfamiliar sounding piece of music in these lectures, an appropriate initial response from you should take the form of some questions in turn, such as, well, where does that music come from? Or what was that language that was being sung? Which is of course the next step to what do those words mean? That's a line of questioning that will finally lead to the answer to Goethe's first question. It's by mounting such an inquiry that you can arrive at an understanding of the artist's intentions in making the art. Without knowing those kinds of things, you surely won't understand the artist's intentions. Once you've been able to determine those intentions, you're in a position to tackle the question of how well the artist realized them. Goethe's second question addresses that. It's a question of technique. If you understand the artist's intentions, you can probably see whether or not the artist's technique was up to the job of expressing those intentions. But if you don't understand the artist's intentions, any judgment you offer regarding the artist's technique will be worth less than the paper it's written on or the breath you wasted in voicing it. And I trust you can understand why. Since this is a step-by-step -step process, be sure you fully understood those first two questions before moving on to the third. Replay this part of the video if you need to, and be sure you've conceptualized it. 
If you've satisfactorily met Goethe's first two questions with an appropriate aesthetic response, which of course must include your ability to justify your judgments, because if you can't show it, you don't know it, now and only now can you legitimately move on to question number three. Your responses to the first two questions will certainly have a bearing on how you finally answer the third. A casual dismissal of the unfamiliar with, I don't know much about music, but I hope I never have to listen to that shit again, gives you away. You didn't think about it at all. You just gave a knee-jerk reaction to a stimulus you found unpleasant because you see and hear everything through the narrow lens of the already familiar. At the very least, you'd thereby cheat yourself out of something that might turn out to be profoundly beautiful and moving, and you risk making an ass of yourself in public as well. I wouldn't want either of those things for any of you. Having experienced both firsthand, I don't want it ever again to happen to me either. So what about that third question? Clearly a snap judgment will not do. Let me try to illustrate what this involves. Ludwig von Beethoven was by several comparative measures the greatest composer in the history of Western music. He cast a longer shadow into the future than anyone ever had or has. After his death in 1827, at least a century's worth of brilliant European composers felt compelled to address the challenges his music raised, almost as if they were in communion with, or at war with, his ghost. No composer was ever more inventive. None made such a radical, stylistic journey through thirty prolific years, and yet, famously, he went deaf in mid-career. That would have been the death knell for the creativity of most composers, but Beethoven slogged doggedly on, growing and growing as a musician, producing some of his greatest, most profound masterpieces during the last half decade of his life, without the benefit of having heard a single one of them. I want to talk a little about his Ninth Symphony, composed three years before his death at age 57. The Ninth is a colossal musical vision. Nothing remotely like it had ever before been attempted. In it, Beethoven took the symphony, a musical form which he had inherited from Joseph Haydn, to a level that even Haydn, great as he was, could not possibly have imagined. Beethoven attempted in his Ninth to enfold the whole world in a warm musical embrace. It is a vision of worldwide brotherhood and sisterhood, a world that will, of course, sadly enough, never be realized. But as Robert Browning famously said, a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? To realize this vision, Beethoven had to add the human voice to the symphony, which had theretofore been a purely instrumental form. He set portions of a poem by his older compatriot Friedrich Schiller, his Ode to Joy, to music, setting them for a quartet of soloists and a large mixed chorus in tandem with an orchestra that was enormous by the standards of its day. He added some words of his own to introduce Schiller's. Every time I hear those words, I'm deeply moved. The Ninth Symphony is a thrilling composition that has won the admiration of many millions of music lovers over the two centuries since its composition and has captured their hearts. A performance of the work lasts well over an hour. Was the Ninth Symphony worth the effort Beethoven put into it? That's Goethe's third question, was it worth saying? I'll give you my answer. I've already said what I needed to regarding Beethoven's intent. I haven't yet addressed Goethe's second question, though, so I'll do it now, applying it to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I have a perspective on this owing to the years that I've spent carefully studying the sonatas, string quartets, and symphonies of this composer, and have come to understand his compositional language pretty well. 
I have approached those works kind of like a scientist, dissecting them down to the level of their smallest functional components and examining carefully how those components work together in his melodic writing, his harmonic language, and his counterpoint. I've observed his orchestration carefully, particularly in his symphonies. As his symphonies grew increasingly ambitious, from their modest beginnings in 1800 to his colossal ninth in 1824, he gradually called for larger and larger orchestral forces in his scores. And as those orchestras increased in size, he was growing increasingly deaf. He didn't stop knowing how to write powerful harmonic progressions and engaging counterpoint because he was growing deaf, but think about what kind of effect that might have had on his sense of how an orchestra sounds, particularly as that orchestra was growing larger. There's no other way to put it. There are some orchestration problems in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I judge Beethoven's Ninth to be a towering masterpiece. I can't think of a single piece of music ever written that was more worthy of being written than Beethoven's Ninth. So my answer to Goethe's third question is a resounding yes. But there's a little more to my answer. I also recognize that it is not unflawed. I can say that justifiably only because I've spent countless hours listening to his music and teasing it apart and examining it critically at every level. I can spot those places where he wrote beyond the limits of his understanding of orchestral sound imposed by hearing loss. So my yes to the third question does come with a caveat. You've just heard the assessment of someone who spent countless hours with not only Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, but several dozens of his other compositions as well, exploring them closely and critically. But it would be a mistake for a casual listener who knows little more than the immediately recognizable Ode to Joy tune from the symphony's final movement to say something like, yeah, I know the Ninth is a masterpiece and all that, but in my opinion, it has its flaws. Do you see why that would be a mistake? Make sure you've understood these things about Goethe's three questions. There'll be some questions about them on the quiz. And do consider adopting them as useful tools as you explore other music or any other art. Now let's take a quick introductory tour of musical acoustics. In its primary meaning, acoustics is that branch of physics that deals with the properties of musical sound. The term has, of course, been extended to such areas as theater construction and noise reduction along highways, but I'm dealing with its primary meaning. The underlying fact of musical acoustics is a phenomenon known as the harmonic series. The harmonic series is due to the complex vibrations of sound sources, such as bowed, plucked, or hammered strings, as in the violin, guitar, and piano, respectively, or the vibrating air column inside a wind instrument, such as a flute, trombone, or pipe organ. Let's take a look at this chart. Across the top are some frequencies expressed in vibrations per second, or hertz. 65.5, 131, 196.5, and so forth. Beneath those frequencies are the names of the notes that result from those frequencies, capital C, lowercase c, lowercase g, lowercase c with an exponent sign of one. Those aren't actually exponent signs, they're just a seriation device, and so forth. In the musical staff, below those note names, the notes are represented using graphic symbols that are understood by everyone who reads music and can be easily understood in principle by those who don't. Capital C in the list of note names applies to the first note you see to the left, which is generated by a frequency of 65.5 Hz and sits two ledger lines beneath a staff with a bass clef sign. 
to furnish you with what may be a useful point of reference, that's the lowest note that can be played on a properly tuned cello. Next comes the note that corresponds to the frequency 131 hertz, identified as lowercase c, and sitting in the second space of that bass staff. Since the frequency of this note is twice that of the first note, this note is an octave higher than the first one. Be sure to remember this. An octave is the interval formed by two notes in a two to one frequency ratio. If you know the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz, the first two notes of the tune constitute the leap of an octave. I'm going to come back to those notes, but I want you now to take a look at the graph at the bottom of the page. You see a series of integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. In this chart, those are identified as harmonics, but I have a better word for them, and it's the one I'd like you to learn. Partials. First partial, second partial, third partial, and so on. I'll explain why later. Back to the notes. Since this chart is about the harmonic series, that line of notes doesn't represent some kind of melody. It's an enumeration of the frequencies that will also be audible in that lowest note if it's produced on something like a piano or a pipe organ or a cello or bassoon. That low note is not a sine wave. It's a rich complex of overtones that are all partials of the harmonic series, less and less audible the higher you go up the series which is what that graph at the bottom is about. It's a graph of amplitude. Now, take a look at the third note in that bass staff. Notice that it lies in the top space of that staff. Notice that it's identified as lowercase g, and notice that its frequency is 196.5 hertz. That's three times as fast as the frequency of the first partial, which is also known as the fundamental. Please underscore that in your mental notes. The sound known as the fundamental, the one represented in this case with a note that lies two ledger lines below the bass staff, is also the first partial. And that should come clear to you when I later show you a graph that represents a vibrating string. Since that note, the third partial, is vibrating three times as fast as the first, that means that their frequency ratio is three to one. Since the second partial is vibrating twice as fast as the first, their frequency ratio is two to one. You'll recall that I identified that frequency ratio as an octave. I want now to identify the interval between partials two and three, a perfect fifth. Part of the reason for that can be understood if you just count the positions on the staff between those notes inclusive. That is, enumerating from the lower note, space, line, space, line, space. Those five positions indicate some kind of fifth, and in this case it's a perfect fifth because it's the interval found in the harmonic series. So, armed with that information, can you figure the frequency ratio that generates a perfect fifth? I trust the answer was pretty obvious to you. It's a frequency ratio of three to two. Maybe you've noticed that I express these ratios from the upper frequency to the lower, two to one, three to two. That's basically starting with the upper note of the interval and reading down to the lower note. One can, of course, figure them the other way, in which case you just reverse the terms of your ratio and the result is, for all practical purposes, the same. So let's go two degrees farther through the harmonic series. After the third partial, lowercase g, the clef sign on the staff changes. This is just to keep everything tidy on the page. It's not acoustically significant. So the next note is lowercase c1, vibrating at 262 hertz. That's four times as fast as the fundamental. In other words, it's two octaves higher than the first partial. Is all this making sense? 
One more, the fifth partial. This one is especially interesting. Its frequency is 327.5 Hertz. It lies a major third above the fourth partial. This partial, which on a cello's vibrating C string would be heard as a very faint overtone, actually contributes a major key bias to the sound of any instrumental music played on an acoustic instrument, or a large collection of them, an orchestra, say. And in case you've ever wondered, this is the reason why minor key music in general doesn't sound as comfortable as major key music, because minor keys are acoustically dissonant. That's why they're often marshaled to express emotions such as sadness or anger. I will from time to time make reference to some of this terminology as we proceed with our exploration of actual music. So be sure you have a good grasp of it and plan on using this information as one of your tools for understanding. Now I want to show you a graph that illustrates this in the form of a stylized vibrating string, provided you imagine everything on that graph in three dimensions, not two. And of course, the vertical contour is greatly exaggerated. An actual vibrating piano or cello string wouldn't look anything like that. Notice that in this chart, the term overtone is used. So the long arc across the bottom, representing the vibration of the entire string as a unit, is the fundamental, or first partial. Now looking at the arcs above that and reading from right to left, we see first the second partial, identified as the first overtone, vibrating in half lengths. Imagine it in three dimensions and it will make sense. That's a two-to-one ratio, or octave. Notice that the amplitude of that arc is lower than that of the fundamental. Perhaps you remember that amplitude graph at the bottom of the previous image. The next arc is the one that vibrates three times as fast as the fundamental. These arcs are looking increasingly like geologic fold zones, in this case with a syncline followed by an anticline followed by a syncline. Of course, the farther we read this chart that way toward the left, the larger the frequency ratio to the fundamental, the smaller the frequency ratio to that of the interval that came before, and the lower the amplitude overall. Bookmark this spot in the lecture just in case you want to return to it. I think that about wraps up my part of this lecture. Go back and listen to it again if there are things in it you didn't fully understand or that you might forget. Remember that these are meant to be tools uh, for your understanding of the music that you're going to explore later in this semester, so you'll want to have a good grasp of them. Even though I'm done here, there's more ahead of you for this assignment. I want you to watch a 15-minute YouTube video by Andrew Huang. He's put together a really nice, concise explanation of the harmonic series, and he's got a studio where he can actually play the sounds that are associated with that series. Notice especially what he has to say about octaves and other intervals, perfect fourth, major third, minor third, etc. You might notice some minor differences in our terminology from time to time. No worries, the concepts are the same. There are simply different methods of talking about the same information. And while you're at it, consider subscribing to his channel. I really enjoy his work and always find it informative. He sometimes makes me examine my assumptions a little more carefully and discover that I need to change my mind about something. That is, unlearn something and learn something better in its place. That is, education. When you're done watching his video, take the quiz that accompanies this assignment and return it to me in a timely fashion.